So good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to uh, Horace's 2021 Equitable COVID Management Solutions panel discussion today. We have a, a very diverse and mixed representation of participants from all across the world. And of course, I'll uh, let them introduce themselves here in a quick second. But uh, just for the sake of our audience, what we're talking about today is equitable COVID management solutions in terms of the corporate worlds that we live and work in. And our participants are going to essentially discuss and share views on how that's played out in their particular industries in the, in the next 40 minutes or so. So I'm going to ask our participants to give a, a, brief, discuss, a brief description of uh, what they do and to introduce themselves and go around the floor and then we'll come back and kick it off with uh, our discussion. Um, would you like to start, Romal, and then we go around the, the sure. school? Yeah, my name is uh, Kumar Shetty. I'm the CEO for Deloitte Consulting in, in South Asia. Uh, and uh, focus, of course, is, is TMT. And I've, I've had a privilege of working across 30 plus countries. So, hi, I'm Asim Abbas. I'm partner at LNL Partner, LNL Partners. My focus area is TMT and emerging technologies like IT, OTT, Internet of Things, and others. Welcome. Ladies first. Oh, okay. So <laughs> greetings from Switzerland. My name is Isabel Nisli. I'm a leadership coach. So I work with business leaders and startups and I've published two books, one on um, power games between boards and management, one on why corporate governance falls short to reduce derailment. And I've co-built and run the Responsible Leadership Institute, an online offline training and education platform. And uh, good afternoon. My name is Stuart Hutton from the UK. So actually, it's, it's a good morning here. Uh, I am a uh, somebody who works in wealth management and investment management. I'm the chief investment officer at Simply Ethical. Uh, we provide a solution uh, looking at ethical and Sharia compliant investing. I'm also the founder of at Other Dots Foundation and also a board member um, of the European Partners for the Environment based out of Brussels, a think tank and do tank. Um, and finally, also, I am a board trustee of the Responsive Finance and Investment Foundation. Wonderful. Uh, thank you, everybody. I think I forgot to give a brief description of myself, but essentially I'm a business journalist for the last uh, two and a half decades, having covered mainstream business across the United States and here in India. And I've also authored a couple of books. Uh, incidentally, both have been on white collar crime and corporate fraud. Uh, with that, I'll, I'll kick this off and, uh, you know, just wanted to essentially highlight that the pandemic over the last year and a half has forced everybody from private enterprise to governments to, to individuals to rethink and reset uh, their entire lifestyles at home and at work and in their professions and in their business. And the idea over here is to try and get a sense of how we've used management methodologies and technology and systems to tackle the new normal. So kick off with the first question, which is, what's the biggest structural change in your particular industry that you have seen emerge as a result of the pandemic? And how has that worked in terms of keeping your ship sailing? So I toss to you, Romal, ask you to sort of take a stab at answering that. Sure, sure, Roman. Thanks. Uh, you know, I mean, I'm in the consulting business, so the really two fundamental aspects of our business that has changed dramatically. Uh, one is people and second is clients. Uh, people really in terms of, it's not that we didn't care for our people earlier, but the way we care today for our people in terms of during the pandemic, post-pandemic, uh, how we train, how we reskill them, how we work in this new virtual world. And a very important part is how do you sort of try to imbibe the culture? Because when you work in a, in a very virtual world, it's very difficult to have the cultural aspects. You can have people working and our productivity has improved dramatically, but how do you really bring in culture? Uh, in, in, a, in a no physical proximity kind of situation. The second one is, you know, as, as consultants, uh, you know, it's a normal trend. You get up early morning, 4 a.m., 3 a.m. On, on Monday morning and you come back Friday evening or Thursday night, whichever it is, midnight. And we pretty much traveled that all our lives. I mean, I've been 25, 30 years in the consulting business. We always travel. Uh, so this pandemic was completely very different because and then we had the complexity of our clients across different industries. So whether they're in manufacturing, whether they're in services, uh, whether they cut across client segments, whether they're government ministries, legacy, or new age, born in the cloud companies, an approach to each of them was, was very different. So we really had to sort of 
uh, say how do we work with different so there was no one size fits all there was really about how we could actually work with each of our clients in different uh, aspects with technology of course helping deliver and i can tell you that we you know one of the projects that we did was across uh, 30 countries where we had teams working uh, and 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 go live happened on date so we didn't have an issue in terms of delivery we didn't have an in terms of financial metrics we probably had one of our best years but uh, it probably was extraordinarily challenging because of what happened in india uh, right in terms of our own teams uh, our, our 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 thing and and how did we sort of adapt so uh, in some sense people and clients uh, adaptation was probably something which is the biggest structural change that happened in our in our industry thank you aromal yeah indeed that that was the case i would imagine for your sector abbas do you want to follow up from there yeah so so i'm a lawyer let's say if i take the example of a legal profession which broadly has two classification corporate and litigation now uh, as far as the litigation is concerned I mean, there is no structural change but what has happened in litigation essentially is lots of online hearing uh, lots of our high courts and the supreme court are listing cases online and this to my mind has brought a lot of efficiency because the way our court system works where the lawyers have to uh, wait for the case to be listed now uh, that now that they can save their time also there are a couple of examples where one lawyer with three lock three laptops can simultaneously log into three different high courts and can attend three hearings simultaneously so uh, so there is a lot of change vis-a-vis the cases needs to be handled at supreme court and high court level but at the district and the session court it's a challenge for the simple reason that the digital literacy is not there the access of internet is not available to all lawyers so uh, that's what has happened in the litigation uh, as far as the corporate is concerned i think in corporate to my my experience is that it has brought efficiency uh, it has brought probably get greater interaction with the team uh, but the flip side is the culture and the values because of the fact that people are not meeting uh physically they are not in the office uh, every organization has some values and missions and it consciously evolves that culture uh, that probably is something uh, which is a challenging area in this in this uh, let's say in an organization how to align your values with the organization that is a great point yeah isabel do you want to follow up from that Yes sure so based on my personal experience and with my company but also my recent research studies among 270 leaders um, across geographies and in-depth interviews it was definitely the shift to digital that the pandemic triggered so as a result of the pressure to um, reduce fixed costs become uh, leaner more efficient more flexible both from a product market but also from a mindset standpoint Um has it worked uh yes i think by and large yes but it has requested the transformation of the business model it has increased requirements on leadership especially the shift competencies so leading on the pressure is a different discipline um and and remotely of course as well but uh, it has entailed also painful processes such as um layoffs of employees that have performed and i think that was also um uh, something new that has not um, been experienced before so it but all in all i think digitization um has definitely helped the ship um sailing um, during the pandemic yes mm. thank you mm. i think i think from my perspective and i think what's interesting is that you know we we weren't prepared for this so we came into this already with technology being the, the big driver towards the change structurally within businesses and i think um you know it's interesting as well kind of hearing what you were talking about there the business leaders kind of scoping out how this will change you know and what has what we've seen is an acceleration of the use of technology through this pandemic period where we've had to not just use it as an efficiency tool or use it as a way of maybe being trying to have a, a less environmental impact but as a necessity to actually keep our business going you know um I'm in a business where you know we primarily meet face to face in the same room You know, we can see exactly what color socks they're wearing. Um, whereas on Zoom, I don't think I've ever seen a pair of socks. And please, I'm not asking for now. You know, that's changed. But I think this is interesting because, you know, I think the technology has been the glue that's held together. And now what we're seeing coming out is how people are saying, "Well, what's this hybrid solution going to look like?" And there's a whole range of here. So there's no perfect 
pinpoint hybrid solution. Industry sectors and businesses, cultures, I think different regions of the world are going to react differently from this. And therefore, we've actually had a, um, this globalization um, where we've spread the technology to kind of expand globalization has now started to create some differentiation between things. However, from that, we're, we're learning to understand, to live with this and manage it. Now, two years ago, I wouldn't have thought I would have been talking at this event in India, you know, at, in my office in the UK at seven o'clock in the morning. So I think we have reached um, a really in, important time structurally within businesses. We now need to spend some time understanding what that means. Yeah. So I think yeah. I'll just pause because I was going to start. Yeah. Keep that, keep that, can keep that thought cooking, Stuart. We'll come back to that a little bit later. But let me jump to the other question that I have, which is, uh, what is the thought leadership in your particular industries grappling with as the world restructures itself everywhere and, and we constantly face uh, relentless change on a, on a daily basis, right? There's also a lot of uh, interruption. There's a, a, a lot of disruption that's happening and there's a lot of unpredictability. Uh, the, the common word or the common refrain that you heard everywhere is unprecedented. And as you deal with a world that is unprecedented almost on a daily basis, what is the thought leadership in your specific universes grappling with? And, and share a little bit about how uh, COVID management solutions are rising as a result of that. Romal, do you want to start on that? Sure, Paul. I mean, um, you know, and I'll talk a little bit about our clients, uh, really, because that's the business world that we deal with. Uh, we've always been used to do business planning, uh, long-term business planning. So really looking at, you know, five-year, 10-year kind of windows, that's pretty much all thrown out now. So uh, any kind of long-term planning is, uh, you know, you, you probably can't plan the next three months, uh, forget the next three or five years. So really, so one is evolving your whole planning. You could have a long-term vision uh, in terms of what you want to do, but your planning has got to be very flexible, very agile. Uh, the second bit is is really all businesses are saying, okay, there's a digital disruption. Everybody is, is, is a me too in terms of digital. But how do we build a sustainable competitive advantage specifically, right, specifically on two areas? One is really how do we embed AI into everything that we do? And then how do we sort of build on top of a cloud? So what was possible, for example, in, in the past, in maybe 10 months, 12 months, two years, can now be done in, in, in weeks, uh, right, by, by using really cloud as a platform. The third problem that businesses are dealing is is really saying that how do we determine the the work the worker and the workforce of the future because that is that is that is something that is evolving dramatically and therefore if you continue to remain where you are you will pretty much die fast so changing these three paradigms of work worker and workforce is extremely critical so those are the big challenges that 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 people are, are really doing but i think that's where the a lot of the investment into time is going to say okay how do we sort of build solutions how do we reskill retalent i mean redesign our, our reimagine our businesses i mean just think, to give you an example somebody who sold pressure cooker uh, a long time back there was no way that the pressure cooker was ever in, in the indian household that somebody wouldn't go and look at the pressure cooker and then actually buy it but now there's a direct to customer so uh, the business model is changing a very, very legacy traditional business models to say, let me reimagine my business, but have a competitive advantage uh, right, in whatever new technologies that I invest because of what COVID has done. COVID has just accelerated all of this. This is going to happen, but it's just accentuated. Clearly sleepless nights for distributors in most industries. Uh, over to you, Abbas. So uh, one is what Romo said, the planning. These are uh, uncertain times, uncertain situations. Uh, we don't know how many waves and what would be the severity and the magnitude of those waves and its impact. So, so long-term planning is difficult. Uh, other, I think, is the youth technology. Now, the process has already started, but COVID has accelerated that process. In my area, for instance, uh, even before COVID, there are firms who had started using artificial intelligence and machine learnings uh, with respect to some areas like a due diligence or a review of a, a contract that will probably accelerate more, which effectively means it will have an impact on the, uh, or especially at the bottom level in terms of hiring associates and senior associates. There would probably be uh, a structural change uh, within the firm because of the impact of uh, AI or machine learning, which has accelerated because of COVID. Uh, now, with respect to litigation, I think the thought leadership essentially will have to create a very robust IT infrastructure to ensure 
that people in districts, the lawyers and the litigants have an access to uh, the digital system and they can participate in online proceedings. Yeah. So for me, the, the key term is um, change leadership. So branded leadership and management theories, they come and go, mostly they go. But two constants uh, remain, one is change, and one is the need to select, develop, and retain um, leaders that, that are capable of anticipating and adapting to the rapid global change and also lead um, through it with the right combination of providing direction, purpose, um, self-awareness, because you can't bracket yourself out, right? Um, the tough intuition, empathy, and that also provides stability. So the challenge in my eyes does not lie in change itself, but in successfully leading people through the transition phase, which there's a lag usually. So the pandemic, as we know, has stretched everybody, so economically, intellectually, uh, physically, emotionally, and big pressure has been put on leaders and especially um, on leadership skills that have never been more exposed, I would say. But interestingly, a common understanding around what good leadership is, is related to personality and qualities. So crises call for strong or stronger leadership and more guidance, but um, home office has changed the dynamic of the relationship between leaders and subordinates. And that's interesting because dealing with, with maximum uh, uncertainties, handling pressure from all sides, um, while leading virtually at the same time, does not equally suit uh, every leader. So the crisis has boosted, in, in my eyes, the need for less ego and more substance. This is really interesting because I think, you know, one of the, one of the I'm going to slightly change the tune of that topic. I think it's about you'd already start to lean towards this. I think one of the biggest factors that uh, business leaders need to kind of, and the leadership, thought leadership needs to process now is the impact this is having on the health and welfare of employees and the workforce. Um, I think we, we concentrate so much on technology and the drive through for efficiency that sometimes we forget that there actually are people behind this. So your example, I think, Isabella, you know, Isabella of the kind of the home office environment where people you think well, are very happy being there for a proportion of the uh, any sector, any workforce. Actually, being in the office is the one thing they really look forward to doing because it's their social contact. And the, the pandemic has meant they lived alone in a one bedroom flat in the center of a city or a town somewhere, isolated. So I think, um, coming back to, um, I mean, so certainly that, um, uh, that Ramal was saying around uh, disruption moving to sustainability, I think one of the things we need to understand with this is that the thought leadership needs to grapple with the concept of that technology doesn't mean that everybody's going to be happy with it. And in fact, that the change in structural workplace environments mean that we also need to start to understand how this affects the health and welfare of employees. Um, you know, artificial, artificial intelligence and the drive of technology has already disrupted the workforce in many ways by necessity to shift it. So it's no longer doing manual work so much. It's now maintaining the machines that do the manual work, just to keep it kind of simple there. But actually, even that's now started to implement a change. Uh, and uh, I think we need to kind of understand what that means for the long term for employment scenarios um, for both the employer and the employee. So as a business owner, as a business leader, how does your workforce start to operate? And how, if you maintain this uh, uh, disparate situation where you don't all sit in the same office, what do you do to help them? You know, what do you do to benefit this process? You can increase productivity. You can create efficiency. You can become more environmentally friendly. That's not necessarily going to help the, the welfare perspective of some of these people. So I think we need to uh, understand this isn't just a, a quick shift. We've actually got a, a massive transformation happening here and that we need to see how we can manage that and through the thought leadership. All great points. And, you know, that leads me to our next question, which is uh, technology is clearly serving as a stopgap and as a, as a problem fixer and as a band-aid for many situations that have been created by this pandemic, right? Mm. Uh, and I was recently reading somewhere uh, as the pandemic ebbs in certain markets across the world, uh, you aren't, you're seeing restaurants crowd up, but the number of waiters is still very, very low. And, and so it leads me to believe and question, you know, are there problems also being created by technology as we move ahead? And what's your experience been on this? 
Pawan, should I take that? Yeah, yeah, please go. Yeah. Sure. Order, yeah. And so, Pawan, we did a, we recently did a uh, APAC survey across all the Asia Pacific countries, and um, you know, one of the the findings was pretty clear that all workers and all industries will be affected by digitization and automation, right? So every that it's normal, but. One of the questions was which countries are, going, are the least prepared for this kind of digitization automation, and 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 what came out was in the AP region was really Pakistan, Bangladesh, and India uh, were the least prepared, and especially in the areas of construction, mining, and transport. Now, there's a lot of things that you you know when you digitize, automate, when you bring in technology, uh, you can, for example, a lot of these jobs get redundant. New jobs will get created but a lot of these jobs will get redundant and therefore what do you do with that workforce so there is uh, you know obviously technology you know uh, having an impact and having a severe impact but on the flip side about about a million people die from uh, sort of occupational accidents or work related diseases right and if you use really collaborative robots uh, they can reduce up to 72% of of common injuries I'll give you an, an, an interesting APAC is, is home to 64% of the world's industrial robots. So it's, it's, a, it's an interesting statistic. And we're still not, not anywhere close to reaching our saturation. But I'll talk about two interesting examples that about technology. Well, obviously, there, there are lots of issues. But uh, we work with the Haryana government to build an Uberized model, really to build a command and control software to basically say, where are the, you know, do you mean COVID and COVID was at its, at its peak to say, where are the patients, where are the beds, where are the doctors, where are the nurses, where are the ambulances, where are the concentrators? Just a simple technology solution of cross matching demand and supply actually saved people's lives. And because of the fact that this could be built on something like a cloud, these normally things would, would take probably six months to do it. This was done in six days, right? So really leveraging uh, infrastructure and, and ability to save lives. Second also, which I think is a, is a model for countries like India, and, and it's a very interesting thing. Uh, uh, it's called it's, it's called something called Bandicoot. And you would have heard of manual scavenging. And manual scavenging in India, uh, and it's, it's there globally, but in India, it's a, it's a big thing in terms of manual scavenging, though it's been, you know, uh, from a law perspective, it's, it's, it's illegal to do manual scavenging. Many, many people died. It's, it's from, a, from an occupation perspective, the maximum amount of people who've died. Uh, so when this, there's a startup that worked on this manual scavenging to say, okay, we'll bring in a technology, do all of the problems, but you know what will happen? All those manual scavengers, and there's a, there's a significant amount, will all go out of, you know, they won't have any occupation, they won't have any work. So they created something which where they called it the Bandicoot Robo model, where they used the robot to basically clean the manholes, uh, right, but with a operator. And so the manual scavenger who was doing this earlier job was actually reskilled to do it. And and a, a third very interesting aspect, there's a company called Zoho in India. And Zoho, for example, you know, basically competes with the Microsofts and the sales forces and everybody else in the world because they create those products. And one aspect, 85% of the people in Zoho are not computer science engineers. And what that means. So people can be reskilled. So it's about this human machine. I think if the human machine collaboration goes a long way, it would help. Otherwise, it can be very, very disruptive. And, you know, countries like us, where you need to create a lot more jobs, uh, there will be issues. Hybrid solutions is the way. Yeah. Yes. Abbas, Abbas do you think uh, technology is going to replace the paralegal or somebody else in your world? So it will, re it will replace uh, some, uh, because especially with respect to the work, which is more of a due diligence or a repetitive uh, kind of stuff. So there would be some replacement and there would probably be creation of some work because the whole tech sector, for instance, is emerging as a very big sector. And that is a new work for legal profession. Now, everything is we whether it's fintech, edutech, everything is tech these days. So and that's as, essentially is a big area which has emerged, which requires new type of uh, expertise. But just for the question of uh, technology, you know, uh, I believe India is a very technology savvy country with more than a billion uh, mobile users and 100 and 800 uh, million broadband users. And we have re examples like a, a digital payment revolution in the last three, four years and telecom revolution earlier. And we have also a very good network structure everywhere. So so technology is here to stay. We can, here to stay. We can always discuss and debate the extent of the use of technology or what are the bad things which needs to be cured? 
But somewhere down the line, I think it will stabilize itself and there will be sort of a peaceful coexistence between technology and we as a human being. Also, I think there is a big difference in the approach. Our approach probably would be different from the generation which has started technology right from the beginning, where uh, their physical interactions are, uh, may, may not be so much compared to messaging and texting. So it will be a mix and match how to use technology and also uh, to which generation we belong. I think that also plays an important role. So, okay. Um, so does technology fix the problem at hand? In, in Swiss German, I would say nein, which is a mix between yes and no. So yes, um, because for all the reasons mentioned, you know, we've, the more you digitize, more likely, the more, um, the better, more efficient your operations run, cost reduction, more flexibility, more um, um, efficiency, but also customers um, increasingly go digital. No, because it reduces human touch points, which uh, first of all goes against human nature. So we are social animals. And second, it also requires remote leadership, as you already um, alluded a bit to it, which is a new um, discipline. So remote teams can function, but it's more of a transactional collaboration. But the question is um, for the leaders, how do you keep them inspired, engaged? Because that's what boosts um, productivity, also health, um, both mental and physical health. And um, you at uh, Pavan and Sur, you both alluded to, you know, that, that chemistry and the nonverbal interaction and all the signs that you can't read when you're on Zoom. And lastly, I would say, since technology amplify human behavior, so the good, the bad, and also the ugly, it really is about how we shape it. So let's ask, when do we trust humans and machines when they operate um, reliably and predictably? So uh, I think it's, it's both. There's always this both sides of the middle. Mm. This, is, this is interesting, I think, because Isabel, you, you, you relate that kind of how that relationship kind of is going to develop between humans and machines. Uh, there was a couple of facts here. Um, you know, we, you know we're, we're shifting towards this environment of cloud computing, um, you know, and ultimately, you know, the discussions around quantum computing, which I'm not even going to pretend to understand, and, you know, the, the, the power behind the technology. So this pivot to digital is being driven by this incredible technology, but there's going to be a requirement to support that. So a couple of facts here. Uh, this year, there's going to be around about 3 trillion minutes, that's 5 million years, of video content that will cross the internet each month. So that's 1 million vid minutes of video streamed or downloaded every single second. Um, we, we, the, the demand for storage is going to be somewhere in the region of around about 2 trillion gigabytes. That's the equivalent around about something like 130 million years of video. I mean, you know, th this is going to require some real big shift in terms of how we manage the technology side. And I think the, you know, we've got to understand that this is a journey that technology is on. We've, we started 100 or so years ago, and we all talk about, you know, this fourth industrial revolution or the technology revolution. And we, you know, we see the fact that, and I'm going to use the word blockchain, distributed ledger technology, blockchain, and the way technology is now accelerating through the use of some elements of it that we never even knew kind of existed or hadn't been designed only maybe 5, 10, 15 years ago. And this shift is happening at such a rate that I think we're going to see that technology is not about a pivot to digitalization, but it's going to become quite core and central to it. I, I kind of have a, um, a question to kind of finish my kind of a little bit here is, is that you know, is the hybrid, is hybrid the solution or is it just the transformation? And the reason I ask that is because at the moment we all talk about, well, yes, we need a hybrid solution. So, you know, I expect over the next couple of years, I will be on stage at an event facing an audience talking. And there will be also times where I'm on a screen and I can't see the audience probably. And all they can do is see me. And this is quite unusual, actually, when you're on a panel. I don't know. We look at the other panelists, you know, but I'm getting used to them now. They now look at an audience would feel quite strange. So, you know, we're, we're doing this transformation. How can we use technology to be able to manage that transformation and still have what I call the humanization of it? Because we don't want to necessarily lose that as well. Yeah, well, so, I mean... Go ahead, go ahead, Amas. Just one small point. Uh, so the use of technology, we know, uh, has resulted in the exclusive use of data, and there are a whole lot of legal issues related to data. Mm. In addition to that, one interesting thing is, let's say if it is an artificial machine, 
you know, who is taking a decision where there is no human intervention. Mm-hmm. And if the, if, the, if the decision is discriminatory in nature or doesn't satisfy the principle of equality, because it's not the humans who are taking decision, it's the machines who are taking decisions. And these are fundamental principles in the constitution of India. Mm-hmm. So, so, so essentially, then the next step, logical step would be that the algorithm with respect to artificial machine should ensure the principles which are satisfied in the constitution or which are principles like equality, freedom of speech and all. So the legal principle have to be inbuilt in the machine itself so that it takes decisions uh, which satisfies the broad principles which are in the constitution. So, so there is a whole lot of things when it comes to technology. <clears throat> Mm. And yeah, one, absolutely. I was just going to add to what Stuart was saying that we talk about uh, hybrid solutions, and of course, you have technology evolving, and then you have different stages to which technology can evolve. Right. I mean, uh, Sir Arthur C. Clarke wrote about, like, sometime in 1937, about teleportation technologies, essentially, are holograms that are maybe a thousand times more sophisticated than what we're using right now, and where I could be walking around in your living room, Abbas, and so could everybody else. <laughs> and while we are still actually sitting in our homes, and interestingly, this is a technology that is already uh, being deployed by some uh, luxury good companies and uh, consumer uh, production houses, and I've seen instances of that. So we will probably see that evolve, and as you correctly say, Abbas, we will also see that uh, have interesting uh, an interesting dichotomy with the legalities, right? How far can you can you do that? So. Uh, let me let me come to my last question uh, for the day, which is what are the organizations in your world or the companies in your world doing to ensure a, a fair work environment, given that the pressures of, of today's pandemic are impacting uh, migrant workers, gig workers, factory workers, uh, intellectual workers of all sorts in their homes uh, and in environments where you're not really monitoring them and they're probably uh, working under pressure and and so what's the equitable solution to improving things for the person who's working in today's world? Romal, do you want to take that? And I'm sure that's something that a lot of your clients are looking at closely. Yeah. So, Pavan, again, I'll give examples. I mean, I think um, what, we're, what we're really seeing is post, I mean, not post, I mean, because this pandemic is, is going on. I don't know if there's a post in the near future. But what we're really seeing is the, the amount of uh, mental health and stress I think is 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 just really really significant. So we are seeing many more uh, many more uh, requests from a mental health perspective to sort of help uh, coming than ever before. I mean, whatever happened in the last four five months is more than what has probably happened in the last five ten years. So we clearly see that, and, and organizations are trying to see how they can help uh, because this is a bit of a big taboo subject. So not too many people you know want to talk about it and things like that. The other thing that, you know, in our in one of the surveys that it, we, we did was we found that Indian women, right, uh, and this was across the globe, at least, uh, you know, 20 countries, but uh, Indian women uh, pre-pandemic and post-pandemic, the stress levels for Indian women was far higher than all their global counterparts, and nearly 50%, 50% of them wanted to change their jobs or give up their jobs uh, because, you know, the, the difficult part is that not only sort of, you know, you know, just doing work, but managing the home and, and it's cultural different aspects of it. So uh, so really sort of helping women trying to see how they can cope up with things and, you know, do, do up that. The, the third part is really some of the companies are really coming around what we call as work anytime, anywhere. So you don't have to be a nine to five as long as you you have a work product and you got to finish that. You finish it wherever you like. You want early morning. You want to do it late night. You want to do it from your village. You know, wherever you want to do it, do those things. And and simple things like, for example, whether it's a Zoom free day or whether it's gaps between, uh, you know, meeting times or 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 the the one big area that we saw was really where organizations, you know, there were cross functional teams put together whose only KRA for three months was just to take care of people. No operational metrics. No revenue metrics. Nothing. And also, as you you know rightly mentioned, because today we have contract workers, gig workers, you know all of those. How do we sort of bring them into the ambit? They are different sets of people. They're not on our payrolls, but how do we still care for them? And the 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 one aspect is also about how do you give time for caregiving? That is caregiving beyond yourself, for your family, for your extended family. 
and and lastly in terms of just reskilling of people because i think the 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 reskilling is extremely important and there's some there are some parallels because you know in the, in the western world to the asian world uh, the western world largely largely i mean i'm not trying to make a generalization have had many layoffs when when the pandemic actually hit so if you look at the the asian world it's much lesser uh, and if i take back to 2007 8 when the, the global financial crisis actually happened in china uh, one of the things was that companies that laid off the least actually became much much more stronger as well so people looked at it very differently to say do we really need to lay off yes this has an impact on profits we need to do it but can we figure out a way can we be more innovative about how we manage our workforce rather than hey you know we don't have work so off you go so those are some some of the things that 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 we've seen you know clients doing in in, in at least our part of the world so i think uh, within our organization something we've done is we have uh, we have this yoga sessions and these are on a routine basis where a professional uh, yoga instructor uh, would uh, perform the yoga and a lot of people from the office will attend then we had a couple of uh, presentation given by doctors in various specialization essentially uh, from the point of view of uh, the mental health uh, also there are doctors uh, the, the lawyers who can access doctors in case of uh, some uh, requirement we have a covid helpline which essentially played a very important role during covid times for oxygen cylinders beds and uh, 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 other things and also Uh, most of the law firms are revisiting their hr policies and introducing this concept of flex hr work from anywhere uh, partly from office partly from uh, uh, remote location locations anywhere so these are uh, some of the changes uh, which are sort of an impact of uh, covid in various uh, policies of the organization So maybe quick comment um, to uh, what Ramal said on the on mental health. Since Switzerland burnout clinics are fully booked, child psychiatrists in many states um, there's a wait list of half a year. So that's um, so there's really is something underestimated that will um, probably that we're going to talk about uh, more um, going forward. But back to the corporate world. So yes, organizations must change um, quickly to change, um, but so must leaders. So I strongly notice the need. for more holistic leaders with a focus on human centricity but there are further aspects so for example what is needed are also credible credible commitments um, uh, in good times so that they hold in in less good times so for example culture of trust involving all stakeholders and ideally it's built before a crisis um then third a lack of clarity of roles and responsibilities always gets accentuated in a crisis so it is critical to proactively align roles then fourth in times of pressure and change communication becomes king or queen and you can barely over communicate so that's often underestimated fifth i would say decision making gets harder in a crisis because a lot is at stake but it really helps um, not remain stuck it helps build confidence trust and it provides direction yeah. then also what i um, heard from my clients is that many of them either didn't have a risk strategy in place or they didn't care all that much about risk management so it took it out of the drawer once here according yeah. to about to, to comply to the law you know within the board uh, board meeting and then take the box and then put it back into drawer so it really is critical to uh, constantly adjust um, right. the uh, risk strategy and and align risk management and lastly i'd say that don't waste a crisis because it can actually create chances so it's easy to lose focus on exploring opportunities while you're extinguishing fires uh, but it can also help get ahead of the curve um, after the crisis and maybe along the same lines learn from challenges which is easier said than done especially during the crisis or shortly after but uh, we tend to move on quickly tend to forget and uh, until the next crisis knocks at the door uh, there's no no things so yeah. of Okay I I mean, I I, remember, I love the idea that now you know one of one of the things being just is making sure you have a zoom free day uh there's the three words that never existed kind of together uh a couple of years ago uh but th- this this kind of like you know kind of heightens to kind of what my dis- my kind of point here is I want to raise so i mean you know what are organizations doing around the world or in my world or anywhere i think in some ways because 
you know, we have had such a shift in so many different areas. Um, we are all treading into new territory and new ground, and therefore we're all trying to learn from each other. You know, we're, the five of us here are discussing elements and points and sharing with the audience that, and hopefully the wider audience afterwards um, to understand you know, some of the things that we are seeing being raised. And first and foremost, I think there is an issue between what is primarily driving economic recovery so we can be sustainable and still exist as a business, as an organization, um, alongside how we adapt to this new environment. Now, we said about really, really early on how some of those efficiencies create some kind of uh, bottom line profits. So that maybe is a natural way to help each other. But there are lots of what I call also hurdles to get across because I think there is some push and pull here. Economic recovery and driving the business to make sure that lost profit from the last 18 months or so can be made up in the next 18 months isn't necessarily going to go in hand in hand with, uh, say, employees' welfare uh, or other aspects. So we need to think about this. The mental health aspect, I think, is really interesting because I think that is going to be one way you could probably pull this together. So, you know, how you treat your employees, increase your productivity and efficiency and able to get an economic recovery out of this could work well together. And I think I'm going to raise one little point around this, and that is that actually female empowerment will be part of that necessity to drive it forward. You talked earlier about how uh, this has been an enabler. I think worldwide, and certainly in many developing countries, female empowerment is going to be one of the key attributes. It's been talked about for a long time. Now it's a really good opportunity to see how that can be engaged and actually can allow this to, in terms of uh, workplace, uh, business startups, support, and those kind of areas to really help this because we are still a long way behind on that. The final point in this, Ampavan, which kind of right, is, is that I think we are coming out of this. We're all feeling a, a bit better about it. We're all kind of feeling we're starting to get maybe even outside and see family and friends and some, no some normality, maybe, or some different normality starting to maybe come back into our lives. We need to prepare for the next crisis. I'm not trying to, I mean, I'm an optimist. My glass is, is not only half full, it's usually full and overflowing. I am very happy with the world and I really want to make a big impact if I can and help others do the same. However, we have gone into this and I, I didn't see it. I didn't see it. I don't think anybody saw it. I think Bill Gates saw it back in 2016 in a TED talk and we all went, what's he talking about? But I, but I actually see something we need to kind of actually look at. We need to understand that the now new norm also is, you know, we are seeing some shift around the climate emergency and other impacts, you know, social awareness. We need to actually enable us to also prepare for the next crisis. All right, back to you. That's, uh, that's absolutely true. I, I think, you know, fundamentally, this has been a fantastic conversation with rejuvenating insights and points of view. And uh, I think if I may add, you know, at, uh, at the risk of idealistic, I think the fundamental driver is maybe just doing the right thing, the right for our planets and for our countries and our corporations and our people. Uh, and that eventually and hopefully will lead to uh, a profitable destination in every sense of the word for all involved. So yeah. I'm going to just thank everybody present over here once again. And since we have a minute or so left, uh, maybe open it up to the audience if there are any questions uh, whatsoever. And I, I, if there aren't, then we will well, this is a wrap, but go ahead, Stuart. I, I, I was going to say, one thing I was going to say, um, someone said, made a comment, there's a quote to me last night. I was out at a, a very nice uh, Indian restaurant, and, and I was talking about some pretty mad ideas about what I wanted to do within the business with my fellow directors. And one of the chaps turned and said, there was a quote by Steve Jobs. He said, the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. Don't stop trying. I think that's brilliant. That's <laughs> and he also said you can't connect the dots ahead of time. So, yes, the future has a way of coming unannounced. <laughs> I like that. I like that, yes. <laughs> oh, I think we've seemed to have lost Pavan. Is he, is he there? Yes. No. no, he's gone. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. <laughs> that's fair enough. Well, Thank I mean, you, everybody. I mean, it's yeah, we've we reached probably the end of the time. I don't know whether we'll get him back, uh, Shireen, but... Uh, I mean, has anybody got any final comments before we disappear? I mean, we're always allowed to kind of overrun by a few minutes, but uh, any final comments? No, I think I, the, the only thing that I'll add to what Abbas mentioned and, and what we're seeing is, is that technology is evolving faster than regulations. That will create its own issues as well. So I think they need to go and government also has to sort of be in alignment with that because as you mentioned mm -hmm. about the ethical AI, uh, as you mentioned, but yes, we've, we've, 
we've got to use this as a as an opportunity i think well is absolutely right use this as an opportunity every crisis is an opportunity to sort of improve mm-hmm. and the, and i think it has always been like that in 1980s in india when the computers were introduced there there were big agitations against introduction of computers mm-hmm. uh, which today looks very simple but then it was a big stuff mm-hmm. so uh, so generally it's generally the way it is the regulation comes much later and the regulations role essentially is to tame technology and by and large this is sort of a consistent trend where uh, regulation tame technology to ensure that it works in an ethical manner yeah. Mm-hmm. Wait. Is there any so, final comment as well? Um, no, no, nothing else. As because um, I could go on for another. <laughs> for me, it really is to uh, to just be as ready as we can for the next crisis. But it's going to come. Um, yeah. It's always unexpected, of course. Yeah. So. Yeah. And I think I think my point, mindset. I agree yeah. with you, Stuart. So I yeah. actually share the same. So it does help. Yeah, yeah I, th- I think it helps every morning when I get up and 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 see what kind of crisis I'm dealing with, you know, at home or work. <laughs> I, I I think that the bottom line here is also is that I think we need to be mindful that whilst technology seems to be providing a solution, we always need to try and make sure that solution is people centric, it's human centric, and the bottom line is that we need to be mindful of you know of the planet around us. you know we can't just try and recover out of this and make do more damage that you know that's important so yeah mm-hmm. okay. well okay. I, i don't i don't think we're going to get him back good thank thanks. you everybody thanks. for uh, thanks everyone yeah. good to see thank you all thank you everyone thanks. take care bye. thank you then bye. take care bye bye and shireen i don't know whether you're there maybe you can uh, close the screen down please yeah